Can you imagine not having access to internet, the world we are living today? We, you would miss out of so many life benefits of connectivity, from financial uh, services to health and education. Actually, today, the uh, United Nations has declared that internet is a human right for, for all. But half the world population is, has no way to connect. That's four billion people, four billion. And have you understood why we still today have climate skeptics? And these climate skeptics are doubting uh, global warming. Well, I grew up in the far north of Norway, in the area you can see here, uh, where in a few months there will be darkness for two, two months. And I can really see that my glaciers, every time I go back, they get smaller and smaller and they are about to disappear. And have you understood and thought about why we can lose airplanes on the way to their destinations, and why both uh, refugees are only found when they are almost drowning and about to, to fight for their lives? So now you probably wonder why I'm speaking about that when my talk is about the verge of the new space revolution. Well, this is the reason to be for the new space actors. New space actors have understood that with new uh, satellite infrastructures, we can ma make a mean to improve and help uh, the life on Earth and give uh, crucial benefits for not only the privileged people that are here today, but also the worldwide population. The way we want to do that is to launch a significant number of new type of satellites, miniaturized satellites, and we will operate them in constellations together in hundreds and thousands of satellites. These satellites will be able to give broadband internet to everyone and everywhere on the planet and take global images of the whole planet every day. What does that mean? It means that we can really understand what is going on today and therefore take wiser decisions for tomorrow. And these mega constellations are less sophisticated satellites than the classical satellites today, but acting together, they are able, <coughs> they are able to give services that one single, much more sophisticated satellite is not able to do. So today, we are expecting more than 10,000 satellites to be launched within the next 10 years. So these new satellites have a big problem still, because when we launch them into space, we really need to control them when they are in orbit. So a conventional satellite uses a propulsion system to stay in, in orbit, but these propulsion systems are really difficult to, to miniaturize. And these small satellites also need uh, a propulsion system for this new industry to be uh, both economically and environmentally uh, sustainable. So we need to control their orbit in space to extend their lifetime, but also to make sure that all these satellites are not having collisions in space, creating huge amount of space debris, and also staying there while they are not operating accumulating space debris. So the only way to control these satellites is by propulsion system. So for example, today when I'm, I'm walking here on the stage, I use friction forces. And when you use a bike or a car or an airplane, it's all based on friction forces. But in space, there is no friction. So the only way to be able to move a satellite in space is to bring up from Earth a propellant and then inject this propellant out, reducing the satellite mass, and therefore you create a force on the satellite and it can move. The problem is that traditional propulsion systems to eject this uh, matter or propellant is very big uh, and very complex, so it will not work for the next generation of satellites. So, I have been a researcher for more than 16 years, 
And I love uh, combining fundamental physics with various uh, applications. And these applications have been in electric uh, space propulsion. And during these years, I saw that the industrial actors, they were trying to miniaturize their engines in a classical way, and they were coming, coming to technological hurdles where they couldn't get the engine smaller. So what I realized is that we had to go back to the fundamentals and challenge the fundamentals of uh, physics and engineering and look at the problems in a different way. So what we did uh, with my co-founder, Dmitry Rafalski and myself, we went really back to the basics and looked at how uh, particles are accelerated uh, out of a spacecraft. And we innovated in how particles are accelerated, what you can see here on the screen, and uh, how propellant is stored and handled in the satellite. So what we did was a, a quite big revolution that I will just show you, so I will go and pick it up. So by this innovation, we actually miniaturized the classical propulsion systems to less than 40% of the size of our competitors. And now you have a real-size engine uh, of this size. This is a propulsion system that will control the next generation satellites in space to make, them sh make sure that the new space uh, will be an industry that is sustainable both for the environment and um, and also for economy. So what I realized as a researcher is that we hold uh, now the technology for the future. And this year, I decided to leave my cozy research position and create the, the company Thrust Me together with, together with my co-founder, Dmitry Rofalski. And what I have realized, whether it was raising the first seed round of 1.7 million euros, and also negotiating the IP licenses with our original institution, which is really supporting us, and also <coughs> leaving my CNRS position. All of this was very new to me, but I also realized that it was new to the people that were on the other side and I was working with. So, for example, 90% of our investors have never invested in space companies before. This is a really new territory for, uh, for everyone. And I think this image is really showing what's going on in the space industry. This is a team, a group photo of Trust Me a few years ago, a few months ago. Um, we, are, we are now growing, but what you can see here is a team of uh, very different people. Uh, and this is how we can make uh, innovation and breakthrough happen by commanding people from different culture and background. And when I'm in culture and background, it's both by education, but also where you're coming from. So with a team of 12 people, we are counting eight different uh, nations, and we have work experience from 13 different countries. And what is happening in new space is really encouraging, because a few years ago, if somebody said, I'm going to do a high-tech company in the space industry, people would think that you are insane, or at least it's not going to work. Well, now, in this audience, I don't think I have to introduce SpaceX, uh, but there are others, like Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, Planet, OneWeb, and then some of us, like us, that are much smaller. And now we are many going into the space industry. We want to do, like I said in the beginning, uh, improving the benefits on the, for the planet, but you have also actors that are dreaming much more. For example, new space actors want to make tourism in space. They want to launch uh, satellites to go and mine for minerals on the closest asteroids, and they want to make humans an interplanetary species. So this is really a new and democratized way of exploiting space. And we have just seen the beginning. And all this is due to innovation and making technologies coming together. So 
in the 60s, in the, new, in the first space race, the innovation really happened in the space industry. What happened in the 60s when we managed to go to the moon was really by innovation. Everything we did in space was new. But then, at some stage, the risk and the economy and the cost took over, and all the innovations happened everywhere but in space. So, for example, in other industries in science, science made us be able to produce new materials, much stronger materials. For example, you can now soon 3D print your car to go, go. And you can, probably some of you in the audience, have even a computer on your wrist, and we think that this is really normal. And some of you are taking uh, photos with a camera that would sustain the temperature and vibration of a space launch. And this camera, you probably use them as a phone. And all this is normal. And now, new space industries have understood that we take all these technologies together, and we are now able to make satellites that are only 1% of the traditional space satellites. And they can still do quite incredible uh, missions. So, my last slide. Are we going to live on Mars soon? And I think, or I'm convinced that one day we will be there, maybe not living there forever, uh, but together, combining all these technologies, making innovation happen both on ground, here on Earth and in space, will make us one day be there. Uh, how soon is actually up to us. Thank you very much.